Can you just tell me a little bit about yourself as well as uh, the name of your company and then we'll go from there. Not a problem. My name is Zach Edwards. I am the owner of Historical Conquest and now its sister company is coming out called Zogos Gaming. Historical Conquest is our physical game company and I've been doing that for 10 years. But this is not just a gaming company, it's actually an educational gaming company, which is a little bit different than most educational gaming. So a lot of people roll their eyes when they hear, oh, educational gaming, it's like, oh, great. Uh, this is actually an educational game where we actually do like 70, we believe in a 70-30 principle. 70% is fun instead of 70% educational and 30% educational because as kids enjoy what they're doing, they're going to come back. And every time they come back, they learn more. So uh, I've actually been, like I said, I was in educational gaming for the last 10 years, game design and such for the last like 20 years. But we started going to digital because there's a lot of teachers that said, you know what, this is great. But as a paper product, one, it's too expensive. And two, we're always the ones cleaning up. So in the classroom, they really wanted something that was digitalized because now everyone has tablets. And so we said, hey, let's, let's do a, a digital gaming system beyond just historical conquest. And now we're doing all different topics from everything K through 12. So you've got English, math, science. Uh, our main one is history, of course, because that's where my history company or my gaming company started. Yeah, so what key features were Zogos Gaming offer upon the launch date? Kids that are in like middle school or high school, when they come home for, from school, they go on their screens. They're either watching videos or they're playing games. So Zogos, what's really interesting about this one is that we went straight to the source to find out what they wanted, what kids wanted. They wanted two things. One, they wanted games that were fun. And that's really important because they will play educational games. They love educational games if they're fun. And that's a big stipulation because a lot of them, they play them a few times and then they're done because there's so much education and so little of the focus on fun and imagery, special effects, those type of things. And that's, as, as adults, we basically have done that to them. We've shown them all these great things. And then all of a sudden we set you in a classroom for six hours in a day or eight hours in a day. And you start drawing and sleeping and anyways, uh, it's like, but um, with, with Zogos, again, we went to the source and they said they wanted two things, one games. And then they also said, well, what would be great is we want to see what we get out of this. So they go to a math class, English class, science class. They're like, okay, so what are we getting out of this? Are we ever going to learn, use this? So we said, okay, so what you're looking for is you want to be able to see the results. And they said, yeah, we want to see results. It's like, what if it was an incentive? And like, oh, yes, that's what we could do. What kind of incentive? So I said, what if we had a coin system? It's like, well, that's great. Is it just points? No, no, no. What if you could use them in the apps? I don't know if you know of these other systems. There's like Roblox. My kids love playing Roblox. They'll play it and they'll spend a hundred dollars in there. The problem is as a parent, I don't want that to happen because one, they're playing games that have no, no benefit to them, yeah. but also, I don't think I was allowed to spend a hundred dollars as a kid. <laughs> well, we, we never, we won't either, but they would. So, um, we actually got to the point where we're like, you know what? No, 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 wait a second. We're not going to spend this money on there. And so they can play the games and, and things are, are fine there. In our system, the, our incentive program is very different. Our incentive program is where kids actually earn them on the screen or even off the screen. And I'll get into that in a second. But the kids will actually earn them by playing games. You don't have to spend any money when you're in the system. The system is there for kids to be able to have fun and they don't have to worry about people getting powered up because they have a ton of money to put towards all their extra power-ups or all their extra skins, things like these other systems. 
In our systems, there's three ways of earning coins. First one is by uh, gameplay. So you play games, you hit milestones, you hit improvements. Again, all these are educational. So there's certain incentives in here to play certain games as well. And you earn coins. The second way is that you actually play, uh, or sorry, you uh, go to school, you do well academically, and you're rewarded, whether it's through your teacher or through your parents. Uh, the parents will actually get them to your, their account. They can't use them. They can only send them on to their child if they do something that shows they're academically improving or such. When their grades come out maybe, or something that happens in the classroom. So they're incentivized to do well in school. But here's another one that uh, most people find very interesting. A lot of times, uh, kids don't have any experience with volunteering, service projects, community service. So we actually incentivize them on the program by them going out and serving the, in the community. And we have an app, a program in there that you actually see in our, uh, we have a fundraiser going on right now to, to create this program as one of the programs in the fundraiser. But it allows the students to be able to experience volunteering. And here's an interesting thing. So some might say, hey, I don't know if I want them to uh, have to be incentivized to go serve. But here's the thing. A lot of these kids will never have the experience or the time or the desire to go out and serve the first time. So they'll never see the benefits of it. Once you go out and serve, you're gonna feel the benefits from it. And hey, you know what? Why not incentivize them? Why not give them something to, to get them out and, and doing something? With the coins, you say serve, and then your coins are called I serve coins, and then they're allowed to go out in the community and serve. So is that kind of a relating to each other in a way? Yeah, that, that's actually where the, the process came from. Sorry, I don't know if you want to go this direction, but this actually all spurred from it was a grant that we were working on for USAID down in St. Lucia. So island down in the Caribbean, they had a really a really big issue with their education system down there and they were asking for help. And so one thing that we did, we had this large package that we were doing for them. And they said, you know what, we decided on who we were going to use. Come to find out it was actually someone that they had chosen before, but they had to post it for other people to try. And they went with the person they had originally desired to use, but they said, you know what, this is the one part that we really want is that coin system that you promoted in your, in your application. And I said, that's great. So over the last two years, we've actually been producing that as well, configuring that. And we have a whole white paper if you want to read more about it, but so that's actually where it all spurred from. Sorry, I went off on a tangent. What was the original question? You're good. You're good. So, okay. So. Zogo's Gaming, uh, you're, you're basically working with students that are K through 12. Some of those, you know, topics in educational, uh, you know, categories. Uh, mm -hmm. What categories exactly? You said math, history. Uh, it, I'd assume that they're learning how, you know, money type of transactions work as well because they're on a coin system. And so they're, you know, earning coins as they're playing games and completing conquests. So what all are they they're learning exactly in these uh, different conquests that they're going on in the games? So I don't know if we're able to do this, but I'd love to, to share a video, uh, an image with you okay. if I could. Yeah. These are all the games that we have in production right now. It's some phase of design or development. So at the top you have time quest, Lightning Round, those ones are already playable. A historical Conquest, the one underneath that, is actually in the beta phase. So one interesting thing, Lightning Round, it's on phase one. Phase two will be more interactive, but the basic idea is this is taking a test of gamifying it. This allows the person that's playing the game to actually, uh, the, the teacher can submit questions and the kids can actually play the game, answering these questions against their other classmates like a pretest, but even more than a pretest, a regular test. So it's gamifying it. They get points for doing it. So the more that they do the the pretests and also the tests, they're actually earning co uh, points that convert to coins, and the coins you can actually use in the system. So other ones that come up are, and you can see underneath the name, the different subjects they're at. So totally medieval is we actually have the physical game. I've got boxes of them like right beside me over here, uh, but that's our physical math game, which we're actually digitalizing. It's 50% through its design phase. You're talking about the finances. Debt-Free Millionaire is actually our personal finance class. 
and this goes through like every situation you can go to. We actually designed that to be a physical game, but there's too much logging in. The kids were spending most of the time writing down their information, how much money they're earning, those type of things. And so it became less of a game and more of an assignment. So we said, you know, we, we need to cut it out here and digitalize this. This needs to be one that needs to be digitalized. Uh, historical, history simulator, so it's, we call it BATS, is actually our history, one of our history games. It's actually a simulation game where kids can actually experience different events all throughout history. And that one, we're actually working with the Department of Education to get that published. Then the iServe service app, that's the one we were talking about, where kids can serve and get points for it or coins for it just by serving locally, as well as, I mean, we're talking about humanitarian aid. If you're creating packages to go off to places that were hit by a tornado or a hurricane, those all get those types of coin uh, incentives. Panic Attack is actually one that I'm working on Funny enough, with my wife, she's a, a mental health specialist. And so we're actually helping kids to understand their mental health and be able to manage the struggles. But it's played much like the game of Among Us, if you ever heard of that game. Um, if not, it's a, a maze where little uh, figures go through and try to um, create certain tasks or do certain tasks. And you have somebody chasing them down. Well. Instead of the, the killing aspect of the, the game, we've made it fully educational and learning about people's emotions, which is fun. And it's not, again, it's the 70-30 principle. 70% 70 fun, a little bit of education so they can want to keep playing it and learning. Pride Gym is actually where you're incentivized on the screen while doing things off the screen. So, you know, in some of these games, they have like little avatars and you actually control the health of your avatar through this game. So you want to go out and do some exercise or get your heart rate up or these type of things because the health of your avatar is actually attached to that. And then Was another that, game. Is that like uh, the iPhone, the health tracker app, like where if you move with your iPhone, it kind of tracks your steps throughout the day? Similar. Now, here's an interesting thing about that. We can't actually use stuff that geolocates them because it's kids' safety. Yeah. Um, we have like everything that we do, we have to think of two main things. One, is it fun? And two, is it safe? Absolutely. Because we have to, yeah, because we have to keep the kids safe. So yes, it's close to that. We actually, we're not just a software company, we're actually working on hardware as well that allows us to do this, but without the ability for people to track or to uh, take data that might be personal. That's another thing that we have to do because this is talking about kids and schools, we have to be very careful on what kind of data we collect and nothing that we produce can ever go to a third party. It's completely inside, it's for teachers and parents, also for us to be able to learn from what, we, what they're doing and what we can do better to produce these games. But we are purposely not allowing that information to go out, to be sold out. None of our stuff will ever be sold to a third party for that reason. Everything is like a secured portal, almost as if you were in a hospital and all your medical records are secure by HIPAA law. Exactly. Without the HIPAA law, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and you, I think we had one more game here on this poster, Shakespeare's Conspiracy, the last one. Can you yes. talk about that? Yeah, so Shakespeare Conspiracy is a literature game. Uh, some might say, oh, literature, how is that going to be fun? This is actually a game that was correct, uh, completed by a Shakespeare expert, and so it's in the design phase, the rules are already set up. We're just waiting for these other games to go through. If you like, if you want to go to our fundraiser, you can actually see where they span on timing and when we'll be able to complete them. But this one's great because you actually learn more than just what was happening in the books, but also about the authors. You learn about the, the literature itself and how it's read and, and such, but it's done at a kid's level. So you're able to have fun with it while learning all these different things. So because Shakespeare is one of the best well-known uh, authors, we wanted to produce a game that spurs on him first, but this game phase two is where you have different authors that you can be able to do. We're focusing on him first, and then we'll span out to the other ones. This one has not been uh, in development yet. As you can see, it's in design phase. Uh, we're hoping to start development soon, but uh, yeah, this is why almost any subject that's in K through 12 <clears throat> can be 70% fun and 30% educational, and kids will want to play it. So, but one of the ways that we do this is we actually 
focus on finding out what the students want. And so we, we work with them to, with fo focus groups, beta testing, uh, and making sure that they're going to have fun with it. Because if it's not going to be fun for them, we don't want to produce it. We want them to have fun and come back multiple times because again, every time they come back, they're going to learn a little bit more. And think of it this way also. So they might play a game, a game like Historical Conquest. You'll actually get people's names and a little bit of information on there. But say the next time you're in class and all of a sudden you hear the name Genghis Khan. You're like, hey, wait, I have a card on that guy. And now everything that is said afterwards, after you hear his name, will be uh, dug into your mind. You'll be able to remember it so much easier because you, you played with it the first time. So just by having two different sources where you hear the same name, it allows you to remember it so much better. And so all these games are based on that same idea. The kids will retain information, just a stat. So they found out actually about 30 years ago, maybe even a little bit more than that, that if you do, if you use lectures and book study in class, kids will retain about 10% 10, 10 of the information that they receive. If you do interactive games, including video games, they will give you about a 70% retention rate. And that's just on like activities that they did before. These are a little bit different. So we actually foresee a lot more retention that has ever come. And so we're talking about the test scores that are happening. One of the biggest things in the news right now is the learning loss that was created over COVID. Now COVID has been gone for a little while, but they're still feeling the effects of the COVID loss. So a lot of these kids, uh, may be at lower levels by the time they graduate than they would have if COVID never happened. So what if all of a sudden they have a system that would actually incentivize them and have, have them have fun with that information? Taking one more step further, if you go into, say, over the summer, every year we have so much learning loss. It takes almost, the teachers almost a month to review everything they re had last year before they can start teaching them what's happening this year. If you have games that are they're actually playing that they want to play throughout the summer, learning all these things, there's minimal learning loss, very small amounts of minimal of learning loss, especially as personalized to the student. The idea that we're going to be working on is that every student should have its own personalized um, uh, education process or, or educational experience. And so the learning loss for that child, if they were at this point when they went into the summer, they should be at that same point when they get out of summer. If they were at lower, they could actually be higher, depending on how much time they spend in the system. So we want to help them with that learning loss. And at the same time, we want to incentivize them to get off the screen as well. And that's why we have these systems to get them off the screen while having fun on the screen, because we already know that most students are gonna be on the screen anyways. Why not produce something that will give them a benefit there? You have such an amazing vision when it comes to Zogos and what you're doing for, you know, our higher education here in the United States. Do you plan on taking this international? Yes, definitely. So one thing we have to do, especially with the system that we have legally, it's we have to keep it in the United States first. There's a lot of different things that we have to do that basically allow us to, to keep it in the United States. And when we go off to another country, we have to do a separate system, same kind of system. But because of different security laws, everything has to be done in its own process. So we're planning to start off here. Actually, one of my business partners is actually from Kenya. And so we actually plan to start producing things to help out there. And as you know, accessibility here with devices is fairly simple. A lot of the, most of the schools produce or have their own devices for the kids, for each kid. Places like Kenya, there's nothing like that. So we're actually going to be helping students there to be able to get to that point where they can have the devices and have the information on their devices to do it. Now, again, this all takes time and money, but that's the that's the plan. We want to get out there. Um, and there's other things that we have that I'd love to be able to talk about a little bit more. It's going to take another interview, but um, and it also has to take time because some of these things I can't divulge yet. But some of these processes are actually made for all these. Some of these games are made with other countries in mind. I'll say one that's actually not on this. It is in the design phase. It just didn't fit in the tent. It was going to be an extra one. You said take off. It's the next one in ours. It's called Geotag. Geotag is a game 
that kids will actually go online and play tag around the world, interacting with people around the world. And uh, there's a lot more to it, but a lot of these games. We World. I don't know if you ever knew what We World or like Club Penguin. Uh -huh. you know, yeah. it's like it's, you get to interact kind of, and you have these avatars and you have to, you know, take care of them. Like they're Sims almost. So it's yeah. really, really cool. Yeah, so we've got a lot of these things that are, are meant for international that are just not to that point yet. Again, because we have to be careful about what we do legally in the, in the United States and then legally in other countries. The UE or the EU has like a, a ton more uh, legal processes we have to go through to do anything like this. So we know what's in the United States, we're going to perfect it here, and then we can bring it out to the other countries to follow their rules as well. Awesome. Yeah, I think we uh, covered lots of topics here. I can't wait for our next interview. Um, so it, the launch date, don't let me yes. forget that. That's the most important thing here. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about when you guys plan on launching and what's what's the plan for that? Yep, so right now, so with a $50,000 grant that we received early on, we actually created the MVP, which means minimal viable product. It's basically, the thing that you'd show to investors and such. Well, we have this MVP, it's called beta phase, uh, of our program, our platform, and three games out of our, our list up there that are already operational, that the kids can play. And so this is the, the first stage. We are right now doing a fundraiser on kickstarter.com to get people to come and help us produce the rest of the games. At that point, for instance, right now we have 500 subscribers. Uh, at a thousand subscribers, we almost get another eight games by another developer placed onto our system. But at 10,000 subscribers, we actually get another one called iCivics. They promise us to, to add us on at this point, and that allows us to have games on there that are not just produced by us, but also produced by other educational experts to help out with, with developing our, our platform. So the fundraiser is basically to to finish the MVP, to get more people on. So the full launch is actually gonna be the beginning of the summer. Um, the beginning of the summer is when we will have the, the three games released. Our fourth game should be finalized. That's totally medieval. So everyone can try it out. Beta phase, we have paid subscribers already on there, but we want to hold off on just putting too many people on there before we feel that it's completely ready. And that's what the fundraiser's for. By the beginning of the summer, we should have the full system up so anybody can play it. Bugs are worked out of the four games that are having issues or that, that are in beta phase MVP stage. And then all of a sudden, all these other games will be start, starting to pop up. Just to let you know, stuff like Bats, which is our simulator, is actually not supposed to come out until next year because it's a huge process. I mean, this is why we're attached to the Department of Education, it's a big process. Um, but other games on here, including like Debt Free Millionaire, that will be fairly soon. A panic Attack, uh, we're set, we're being told by three months, we'll have that completely done and, re and ready. And then the iSurf service app is actually one of the first ones we're working on to finalize uh, because that's a way of getting incentives or coins on the system. And so we want to be able to produce the uh, this app so people can start using that, especially over the summer where kids have plenty of free time and they don't have no idea how to spend it minus on the screen or maybe hopefully playing with friends and socializing. Well, this would be a way of getting them to be incentivized to do that, to go out and serve, have fun, meet new friends and such. So uh, below this video, what I'll do is uh, drop a link to where, you know, we can show people this is what our project is on Kickstarter. Here is also our website, our white page, um, and also anything else that we should share. We have the the link for the fundraiser, and you said that there is a a way that they can sign up for like a demo for beta testing, so that they can kind of try out how the video games and the program works with Zogos Gaming. So yeah. all those things. Uh, what we'll do is we'll drop them down below in the video. Uh, just to wrap this up, it's been a pleasure speaking with you, Zach. Uh, so one word, if there was one word to describe your vision for this project and what it is that you're aiming to do for the higher education space, 
and all things education, what would that word be for Zogo's gaming? I would have to say it probably be innovation. Yeah, we we want to innovate. We want to make education not just us. We want to, any ed tech company that comes in and wants to help produce things for kids. We want them to see that it is um, exciting. It is innovative, and they will actually make um, a profit off of it. Uh, right now, it's one of the least invested industries, and yet one of the most important uh, industries. So we want to be able to show people that like, you can actually make money as a company by investing in the ed tech world. And so this is uh, this is us innovating and showing the future to, to other companies and other people that want to be part of it. And again, we have developers attached to us. We have people that are already doing this in the ed tech world. We're going to attach them to our system and we're going to make sure that kids can be able to access all these great innovations so that we have a more enlightened and uh, uh, ready for the future uh, student body when they come out. So they're ready to, to go to college or a trade school or anything. I mean, we didn't even talk about the scholarships that are attached to the system. So yeah, I would love to have another interview with you. I know that this will bring up a lot of different questions. And so next time you have a time, please yeah, well, let me know. Well, I'll create like a little series of interviews. Anyone that is engaging, you know, with this project, get tuned in with Zogos. Uh, read the white page, look at the website. We've got a lot of videos. So there's tons of stuff that we're preparing for um, on social media. So stay tuned. Uh, and uh, we're going to be producing crazy content, lots of it every day. And you can stay tuned with us on YouTube, on LinkedIn. We've got a business page. Instagram, TikTok. So just watch out for what's going on because all those updates and upgrades for Zogo's Gaming will be coming out. Zach, it's been awesome speaking with you. And is there anything else that you'd like to say for just this first interview? And then, you know, anything else that we can add that we'll go ahead and speak about in the next interview? Yes, please. Thank you so much for this opportunity to, to talk with everyone. I just want to be able to say to everyone exactly what Madeline said. Come in, expect to, to learn a lot, expect to walk away with a lot of questions. I think one, one thing that'd be really nice for us to do at some point is to go on Twitter or Discord and actually have a, a live interview where people can ask questions and let these people, let everyone ask questions. I wanna be the most trans, I wanna be one of the most transparent companies out there. I want people to be able to trust us and, and know that, especially because we have kids that we're working with. We want people to trust us. That, that's one of the biggest things. Security is the, the biggest thing when it comes to our children, keeping them safe and keeping them continually growing and, being, and, and learning. So thank you so much for joining us, everyone, and uh, hope to talk to you guys soon. Awesome. Thanks so much. <laughs>